Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to once again feast upon your word. I thank you, dear Lord, that your judgment is just, that you are a righteous God. I thank you for the rest that you've given us in Christ and the rest that we will someday soon receive. I ask that you would touch in a special way all those who are hurting and despondent, those who are going through difficulties and trials. And I ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the second epistle to the Thessalonians, verse by verse, and we're going to pick up here in chapter 1, verse 4. This may be somewhat of a solemn, uh, more of a solemn video than, than usual given the particular context and as always I'm concerned my concern is bringing out of the text that which is there not reading anything into the text that's not there so I hope that you will find this helpful I hope that you will find this video a blessing beginning at verse 4 so that we ourselves glory in you, the word there is boast, as I mentioned in my last video, in the churches of God, for your patience and your faith. And of course, I, I touched on the fact that the word boast, we don't boast according to the flesh, but Paul was boasting in the churches, in the churches of God, so that they would also imitate those at Thessalonica in regard to their patience and their faith and all of their persecutions and their tribulations that they endured. Uh, uh, the word there endured, uh, a good translation of that would be persevere. Uh, I would really more like to think of it as preservation, God preserving rather than their enduring because God is faithful, which is what we read at the close of our study in 1 Thessalonians. just want to take a moment to talk about faith, our believing God, trusting God, which I've often said is, I believe is the most important thing uh, about us. It's what God, I believe, desires the most of us is to trust Him in all of our circumstances. Now, of course, our, our text does not say circumstances, but if you look closely at this text, even though it, it says in all of your persecutions and tribulations, the word persecutions and tribulations, troubles, I believe that is all inclusive. I can't help but think of Job in trusting God concerning everything that he suffered and he endured. And our text in verse 5 states that which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. A manifest token. That phrase simply means a, which is a manifest token proof it is a proof of the righteous judgment of God we've got to hover over those words for a bit righteous judgment of God because it, it comes out very forcefully in the text we see the same basically the same idea expressed in verse 6 And 
when it where it says seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you our faith our patience and faith in all of the, all of the tribulations the troubles the trials the circumstances in which God preserves us through that we endure because of the faithfulness of God is proof of the righteous judgment of God. Well, how can that be said to be proof of God's righteous judgment? Well, first of all, and I've stated this on, on probably on at least more than once, No one, folks, nobody is going to get a get-out-of-jail-free card here. Okay, either your judgment was placed on Christ or you're going to receive that judgment. It's either going to be one or the other. We didn't get off scot-free. Our judgment was placed on Christ and that judgment is just was just it is a righteous judgment it's a just act on it was a just act on God's part in laying all of your sin on Christ where that God was propitiated that is satisfied fully satisfied for the for the penalty that by the penalty that was paid that you may be counted worthy, that is, in Christ, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. It is, there's no question mark here, folks, in the text. The, what the text is not saying is that, well, maybe we'll be counted worthy, maybe we won't. What the text is connecting here is the fact that God's justice his judgment is righteous. God is just as it concerns His righteous judgment. And we are counted worthy because all of our judgment was placed on Christ. Worthy of the kingdom of God. And that is all-encompassing. That, that For you dispensationalists out there, that kingdom of God encompasses all dispensations. It's not a, a reference referring to the thousand-year reign of Christ. Usually that phrase, you'll see that phrase in the context of, it, it's a, it is often, ex, you'll see it expressed as the kingdom of the heavens, which may sound a little bit confusing, but when you see that phrase, kingdom of the heavens, it's usually talking about the thousand-year reign of Christ, whereas the kingdom of God, as Nicodemus was hopefully understood it, encompasses it all, for which ye also suffer, seeing that it is a righteous thing with God. Here we are, we're looking at God's righteousness being expressed, emphasized once again, to recompense, that is to repay, to give what is due, tribulation to them that trouble you. And uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the difference between that vengeance of God, that uh, recompensing, that repaying, that uh, it is not vindictiveness. It is, it is absolutely related to the righteous judgment of God that God is just. It's not a, a... The word recompense, folks, means to repay. That's what the word means. But there, there is no vindictiveness on the part of Christ in recompensing tribulation to them that trouble you. He's only doing it because it is only just. That's if you follow what I'm trying to say here. Verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. 
Well, there's there's a mouthful there. There's there's a lot to to really slow down and look at there in verse seven. And to you who are troubled, he's speaking to the believers there at Thessalonica. The Holy Spirit is speaking is just as much to us today. Rest, the word rest. I want you to highlight that word rest if you would in your Bible or or just take make a side note of that because we're going to be talking about that uh, it's not something that we want to skip over or or look at lightly okay the word rest is something that we really need to take and, and hover over for a bit and spend a little bit of time looking at because there's something very interesting here being expressed in the word rest. Paul says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Rest when? Don't miss the when. The time is given here. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. That's the second coming with His mighty angels. So just, just make a note of that. I'm going to be talking about that rest. In flaming fire, verse 8, verse eight in flaming fire, taking vengeance. And, and if you look at, you Greek students, if you look at the root of the word vengeance, it means justice. We tend to think, look at, at you know, well, vengeance is best served cold. I mean, you know, like... Uh, what was it in the Star Trek movie, The Wrath of Khan? Folks, we cannot bring our human emotions into this text. We've got to look at it from a divine perspective. This is a very solemn subject here. In flaming fire, that, that is, uh, I believe what the authorized version says, taking vengeance... That is justice. And the word taking, if, if you're using the authorized version, I believe you'll read taking, the word taking there. The word taking is the word to give. Okay, that's what it means, to give. And vengeance, the root is justice. To give justice. You could rightly translate this in flaming fire to give justice on them that know not God, and that the word know there is not an experiential knowledge, it's perfect knowledge. Why? Because these are Satan's children. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, so they didn't do what we did. They didn't. Uh, they didn't. They didn't believe, receive, repent. Uh, were baptized. Were they didn't go through. They didn't go through down through the ABCs of salvation. They didn't dot all the I's, cross all the T's. They didn't do what. They didn't obey the gospel of the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, that's not what the text is saying. First of all, the word obey is hupakuo in the Greek. If if I said to you in the Greek, I want you to hear what I'm saying. I want you to hear, the word hear is a kuo. If I said, I want you to obey your masters in the flesh. I want you to obey the law. And I, and I use the word obey. Now I'm using the intense form of the word to hear. It is not a kuo to hear. It is hupakuo. That is the word for obey. There's a word in the Greek for do. If any of you Greek students out there, just look at any word in the, in the Bible where it says do, and the word is poieo. It's where we get our word poet, to create. The word do is poieo. Poieo. The word obey is hupakuo. It is the intense form of hearing. That is what they didn't do. They did not hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Well, Jesus said, we know from John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Uh, I've, I've touched on that verse I don't know, a number of times. He gives justice. God gives justice on them that are, are, they are, are not sheep, they're goats. They're not wheat, they're tare. They do not know God. They have no experiential knowledge of God. In fact, they don't even have a perfect knowledge, which, which is just, and the difference between perfect knowledge, the word there, know, is oida. It's not gnosko, experiential knowledge. It's oida, perfect knowledge. They don't even have a perfect knowledge of God. And they, they cannot hear because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. They obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, I could spend a month, if I just stopped right here, I could probably spend a month just talking about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the gospel is not that you have to do something to be redeemed. You won't find one single verse in Scripture that says that we have to do something to be redeemed. Not one. Not a single one. The very expression of the, of, uh, of the gospel itself in the New Testament, particularly by Paul, it is expressed in very explicit terms and it is manifest in such a way as to where that it is impossible to read anything into that gospel that you had to do the good news folks is what christ has done not not what you must do and verses five six and eight of our of our present study here five six and eight all refer to a righteous judgment of God, that is, divine justice, from a righteous judge, one who is righteous. Now, we know from Jeremiah chapter 30 that there is a thing called the time of Jacob's trouble. So we're going we're gonna to quickly look at that. Verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble, folks. Not, not left behind uh, members of the church. Not left behind dismembered from the body of Christ believers' trouble, but Jacob's trouble. We have to all be raptured since we all return with Christ at the second coming. Those of you who followed us through our first our study of the first epistle in in First Thessalonians chapter three, we read to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with who? With all his saints. And the flame there. I know many of you are, are probably looking at this in different translations. Singular. It's a singular fire of, of flame. It's not, it's not flames. It's, it's singular. Now, I take that personally to mean that the entire heavens will be ablaze with His glory. Flame is also fire in motion. This flame of fire we know it accompanied uh, his manifestation in the burning bush of, of Exodus, as well as his giving of the law at Sinai. The flaming fire is the element in which our Lord Jesus Christ is revealed. It's not the means by which he takes vengeance on the wicked. And before you get the wrong idea about the word vengeance, fire is related to the believer's judgment 
It's, it's the, uh, the destiny of the wicked, the lake of fire. We've got the lake of fire as well as the, it, when it's everything is all, when it's all said and done, the present creation is destroyed by what? It's destroyed by fire before the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. The root of the word here, I, I can't emphasize this enough. The root of the word here in our text means justice. The And th this expression in the original text is, is, isn't found anywhere else in, in, in any Greek literature. It does not mean taking vengeance in the sense of taking uh, his revenge as, as though our Lord has some personal grudge. What it does mean is assigning retribution, appointing to each man righteous judgment. Appointing to each man justice. It's what's just. Now, uh, and there's a difference. We, we tend to read our human emotions into this. Um, you know, you could, you could think of that judge that's uh, in a courtroom. That's, he's, he, he's sort of separated, and I know this is not always the case, but he's separated his personal feelings from the sentence that he's meeting out here. He's, 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 he's basing the sentence on facts and evidence and the law. It's just, it's what's just. That, I know I'm, I've never been known very well for my illustrations, but that's the best one I can give you. I don't, I cannot look at this in the same sense that many, many of us as Christians do. if uh, that surprises you. Now, we're going to talk about a little bit about this word rest. I, I would ask that you would, each one of you following this, if you would just simply get a, 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 a piece of scrap paper and a pencil, a pen, and, and we're going to, I'm going to have you write down three words that I, because it might help make it easier to keep these separate in your thinking as we go through this. There's three words that I want to talk about here can, that uh, for the word rest, R-E-S-T, three Greek words, all different that I want to talk about. So just to keep that kind of, to help you keep that straight in your head, uh, you might want to just take a note and write these down. There's a present rest that we, that we read about in Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore remaineth a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore us labor, therefore. It's a labor. And believe me, it is a labor to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. I've often written correspondence where I, to others where I would sign it, uh, rest in Christ. What, what do we mean by rest in Christ? We rest in His finished work. We cease from our works and rest in the finished work of Christ. Just as God rested after six days of creation, after just as God rested from His works, we rest. We rest in Christ. Resting in Christ is a is a far. How should I put it? Our resting in Christ is is just simply light years away from our laboring to produce for God in the flesh. We rest, He produces. So there is a, a, a present rest. Kata pausis. Kata pausis. If you want to write that down, 
I'll say it one more time. Kata, pow, sis. Just, just make a phonetic note of that. That is our current rest. Now there is a future rest, and we're going to talk about it. That future rest is found right here in 2 Thessalonians 1.3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you, the love of every one of you all toward each other abounds. Verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. Okay? Rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, the second coming, in flaming fire, taking vengeance, justice on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word rest here, folks, is the word ah nessus. If you want to write that down, ah nessus. Rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed. So there is a future rest that is distinctly separate, different from the rest that we will experience or know or understand at the second coming. Anesis. Now the word there means to let loose, to slacken anything that is tense. And many of the commentators have said, for, explained it by saying, for example, a bow, the string of a bow. You know, you draw the string back, it's your tense, the bow, the string is tense, but then you relax the string on the bow. That's literally what the word anesis means, is to let loose, to slacken anything that is tense. It means a relaxing, a loosening. It means a relief. Rest. 2 Thessalonians 1 7. The seventh verse here in our present context. So if you've written down Anessus, you might just uh, tag that with a note saying future. That's our, that's our present context. That's what we're looking forward to is we're looking forward to Onesis. Onesis. The rapture, and uh, this may, I don't want this to discourage any of you, but the rapture does not include this rest. Okay? The text is clear. Verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when... When? When the rapture takes place? No. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. So this ra the, the rapture does not ensure this rest. Why? Why is that? Well, folks, it's because it isn't over. This rest clearly comes later. Oh, but Steve, you know, what about the... Uh, well, what about God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there, there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And, well, the context of that is, if you look at the context of that verse, it's a new heaven and a new earth. I'll go ahead and read that. Uh, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, etc., etc., etc. 
Now, I want you to uh, think about those souls who are under the altar in Revelation. White robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. Now, we've got the word rest here in this context. That they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Rest there is another word. Okay? The word there is anapao. Anapao. So, it's clear that there are three types of spiritual rest. At least three types here in our present study. I believe that's, that's all types, but you, you might want to check. Some of you might want to take the time to check that out to see if there are any other forms, any other uh, words used to express the English word rest. But I see these three types of spiritual rest. At, at least these, these three types are, are what I want to discuss in this video. So, it, from what I'm seeing, folks, is that right now we are to enter into His rest, katapausis, okay? Katapausis. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Katapausis. Uh, and though there is a rest for us, just as there is for the souls that are martyred during the tribulation period, and I want you to remember, we've already been given white robes, which, which they, under the throne, are given when told to rest on a pao, a little while. There's also a rest, a nessus. That's, that's the rest where the, you know, the bowstring is relaxed that we receive at the second coming. It isn't over. It isn't over for us while the tribulation period unfolds for there to be a nessus. And Paul uses, interest, it's interesting that Paul uses a nessus when he says, I had no rest, a nessus, in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. There in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now certainly, Paul had entered into that rest that we read in Hebrews caught a palsis. Now, I'm personally, I'm convinced that he did. The saints beneath the altar who've been killed, who are preoccupied with God's justice concerning their deaths, are told to rest on a pao. Revelation 6, 9, and and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? This is the word used, that Jesus used when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. On a pao. Matthew 11. Not the Hebrews' rest that that we know. You know, there was since there was no church at that time, folks. This is a pre-church Jewish kingdom offer, pre-Calvary, pre-Pentecost context. Matthew chapter eleven. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you anapao rest. It's different than the Hebrews' rest that the writer of Hebrews, uh, whether it was Paul, some say, some say it was, it was Paul, some say it was not. I don't think anybody knows the rest that we enter into there in Hebrews. That's the rest that we experience now. So, we are told to enter into his, his kataposis now. And during the tribulation period, I believe that we will, like the tribulation saints who were, who were killed, on a pao, and at the second coming, we will anesis. So I hope that you haven't found that 
too confusing. And I want you I don't want you to let it escape your notice that the identity of the 24 elders there in Revelation, the church, which many believe is represents the church, it proves both pre-trib and the fact that there must be a gap between the rapture and the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. If you just look at what's going on there, it, it really does tend to reinforce the fact that there is a gap between the rapture and the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. I understand that uh, much of this is a little meaty and, and, and maybe you might, some of you may have a little difficulty grasping it the first time. I don't want you to, to feel in the least bit inferior because of that. Uh, I've struggled with these verses. You, you have to do the same. Uh, it may help you to watch this video a number of times to, to really, it, it is hard to con for anyone to convey their own thoughts through, uh, through media like this. Uh, for others to, to get the, the full benefit of the richness is, would be a good way to put it. The fullness or the richness of the, of of what I've seen as I've studied this. I want you to note the similarity between Second Thessalonians one six, to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. God will avenge the wrongs which they had suffered. In Revelation six ten, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? You know, their concern, God will avenge the wrongs which they had suffered. And you can also compare that to Genesis chapter 4. Go all the way back to, to, to uh, the book of Genesis, uh, Cain killing Abel. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I don't, I don't believe that these are petitions for personal re revenge or a looking forward to it, you know, vengeance, you know, uh, that is justice is mine, saith the Lord, okay? But a, a, a longing, a yearning for the termination of retribution on the wicked. We just want it to be over, folks as the souls under the altar want. They want it to be over. We want that rest. We want the bowstring to be relaxed. We long for Onesis. I believe that we will rest during the tribulation in the sense that the martyrs were told to rest. Anapao. And then rest. There's another rest coming, folks. Onesis, as our text says, that we will rest when He is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. That is, when we return with Christ at the second coming. Verse 9. Verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, well, that's one thing, and from, here's another thing, the glory of His power, and now we have a time given, when He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all of them that believe. Because of our testimony among you was believed in that day. That because our testimony among you was believed, that's in parenthesis, uh, to be admired in all them that believe in that day. Okay? Because our testimony among you was believed. In, in other words, including you who have believed our testimony. Just, just as the Thessalonians believed Paul's testimony, many will believe the testimony of faith exercised during the tribulation period, which is why those who were killed for their testimony were told to rest for a short time. There's a rest of faith now that produces fruit, 
a rest of faith while God executes His, his judgment that produces results, and a final rest when Christ returns and punishes the wicked, all three being different words for rest. Ah, nessus, to let loose, slacken, a loosening, a relaxing, a relief. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. What we see here, folks, in verse 9, verse nine and 10 is these that are punished with everlasting destruction, they have no experience of His presence. Uh, it's, it's, they're forsaken, they're abandoned uh, to be banished from the presence of God for all eternity. There's no experience of His presence, no experience of His, his power. But at His coming, there's, there is no experience of His glory in us, no experience of our admiring Him, is what our text is saying. In other words, if, if you're look, really looking forward to all, all these non-believers being... Uh, uh, our admiring Him when He comes, when, when He returns at the second coming, of our admiring Him or His glory in us, well, you can forget it. They're not going to... The text won't allow us to say that. It, the text says, just slow down and read it, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day. So we return with him. Uh, we didn't read any of this, folks, of this fire and, and uh, the flames of fire and vengeance and all that. We didn't read any, anything about that in our last study uh, uh, there in First. Thessalonians concerning the rapture. You see none of that there. None of that. I, I, I'm pretty certain that most Christians, the majority, probably for the most part, they uh, they see His coming as is in two parts, the rapture and the second coming. There are some who just believe that, in, that He returns. That's it. No rapture. He just returns. But the text couldn't be more clear that we are raptured and we return with him back in first thessalonians chapter 3 to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before god even our father at the coming of our lord jesus christ with all his saints that uh when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired well that word admired uh if some of you want to look at that up close with a magnifying glass, the word means to be astonished out of one's senses, to be awestruck, wondering very greatly, to cause to wonder, to regard with amazement in all them that believe, that is, by all who have believed, including you who have believed our testimony. No, folks, vengeance is justice, not vindictiveness. You know, sentence is handed down because it's just. Think of it like the judge in the courtroom where it's not about personal feelings, it's not about some personal vendetta, but a just sentence based upon facts, based upon the law. A just sentence. And for those of you out there who tend to doubt your salvation, well, Steve, I I'm not sure. I hope I make it. Man, I'm trying hard. I sure do hope, you know. Well, first of all, to, to even feel like that or, or speak like that, you have to ignore a lot of text. But I just want to point out the fact that... I, let, let, me, let me see if I can put it this way. Don't tell me 
that you believe God is just in His punishment of the wicked. While questioning the righteousness and the justice of God, being fully satisfied by His placing your judgment on Christ. And I don't think I could say that again if, if, if I lived to be a million years. I hope that got the point across, but in, ca in case it didn't, listen carefully, folks. It was just. God was righteous. God was just in laying all of your sin on Christ. God, God is, was fully satisfied by the penalty that was paid. It is a righteous judgment. If It's either going to go one or two ways. Either the judgment was laid on Christ or it falls on you. It either fell on Christ or it's going to fall on you. And the very reason why we're, we're looking at God's righteous judgment being exacted on the wicked here, okay, that, that God is just in doing that. Don't tell me that He's just in doing that and then, and then, and then tell me that, that you doubt that, that there's this uncertainty about the fact that whether, of whether or not He laid all your, your sin on Christ. Or that, well, Steve, I know, he, I know Christ paid for all my sins, but, you know, yeah, I, I understand that was all settled, but, you know, uh, but then that was in the past. And, man, I've sinned a lot since then. And I've sinned a lot every day. And I'm just not so sure. You know I mean? I just, I just hope I make it. That is a whole entire wrong understanding of God's righteous judge, judgment, folks. Okay? God is just as just in punishing the wicked as He is in declaring you righteous. It was through the, the justice of... It was by the justice of God. It was a righteous act of God to place all of your sin on Christ where that you were made the righteousness of God in Christ. Rest in that. Rest in that hope. I love you all. I truly do. I ask for many of you to to consider praying for those in Iowa that were devastated by the storm, for all of uh, our brethren out there who are hurting, who are going through difficulties and trials in some, in some way. I ask your, for your continued prayers concerning this ministry. I thank you for all of your love, your concern, your prayers, your comments, and your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.